own uh, friendly fires. Uh, we're um, probably Ontario's largest for sure, maybe Canada's largest uh, a company that does uh, fireplaces, uh, solar, and barbecues. We have four locations, as Louise was saying, across across the province. In, uh, and right here, we're kind of in the middle of, of three of them. We've got Coburg, we've got Peterborough. I'm up from the Kingston store. Um, and uh, we've got Carlton Places, which is just down Highway 7 a little further. Uh, some of, one of the most wonderful things I had in my life in 2008, as all, all you probably know, solar became a really big thing in 2009. Um, and we were the first company in Eastern Ontario to hook ourselves up to the grid selling power back to the grid using wind turbine solar panels and we had David Suzuki at the store and you know for a guy who's been in the environmental side of things for a long time it's like being in a local band and the Rolling Stones show up you know it's, it was kind of a big day for us there in Kingston it was really nice in uh, for about six years I sat on the National WET board you probably heard the, the, the acronym WETS uh, from your insurance companies uh, yeah. So in, from 2004 to 2010, I sat on the National WET Board. Uh, WET stands for uh, Wood Energy Technology Transfer. Uh, we, on the WET Board, we worked on training people to know how to install solid fuel burning equipment uh, properly in your home according to the code. So you probably heard that, put your hand up if you heard that WET from your insurance. Yeah, most people have heard about that. Okay. Uh, I've sat on a lot of community. I, I was born and raised in Frontenac County, uh, just north of Kingston, and I've sat on a lot of community boards uh, in the region with green initiatives. I also sat on the uh, Ontario government's microfit advisory board, so we were one of the few companies before 2009 that actually sold and installed solar in Ontario, so I was a part of that whole process um, of getting more solar panels installed in the province. Uh, just last year, a little over last year, we're in 16 now, in 2014, our company was the first company to be nominated, uh, Canadian company to be nominated for uh, Fireplace Store of the Year, and we won. Uh, it's a North American uh, award, and we were pretty honored to win that at our local, uh, or our national uh, group. And this year, to that, well, 2015, um, we were, uh, we were chosen as uh, best in class for the uh, Ontario, <laughs> Ontario Home Builders Association for our fireplaces. So we're pretty proud about that. We're pretty proud of our staff who have done a lot of work uh, over the years. So I hope this shows a resume of, of, of I might know what I'm doing. I'm not sure with, with all these folks here burning wood in the audience. So today what I want to do is I want to talk about burning wood safely. That's a really important thing. Um, making sure we're doing it efficiently, you know, burn less wood, easier on the back. And uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're doing it right for our community and uh, for our families as well. And like I said before, any burning questions, just raise your hand, we'll get them answered. So far so good? Yeah, nodding heads, okay. So I want to talk about some stoves, fireplaces, and central heaters, what that means. Uh, I want to talk about new, cleaner burning technology. Um, and when I say newer, uh, they've actually been around since the 90s. But like my grandmother's cook stove, uh, wood stoves last a long time. We had one in our cabin uh, from 1926. You know, wood stoves, you just don't throw them out like we do computers or our phones. Uh, I want to talk about safe wood heating systems, how to maintain it. I want to talk about firewood, and some folks brought some samples today, which is great. And uh, how to burn without smoke and why, why that's important. You know, why, why uh, when I drive down the road and I see smoke coming out of chimney stacks, I want to stop and knock on their door and give them a lesson in wood burning. Um, but why it's important to burn without smoke. Okay? So, wood... As most of you here know, it's a very responsible choice. Um, it's responsible as, as long as we, we do it safely. Um, like the folks here talking tonight, we're harvesting our trees sustainably. And that's important as well. I was taught by my grandfather, who was taught by his grandfather, how to go to the woodlot and take down the proper trees. And 
A lot of that knowledge is not is being lost now in today's generations. We're not passing that along. It's great to see local initiatives like this that are, are, are getting back to that sort of thing. Ah, a little trivia question. How many acres of wood, shout out if you know, how many acres of wood would you have to grow to keep, if you're doing it sustainably, to keep your house heated forever? Eight? Any other guesses? Ten? Ten? Seven. Fifteen? Seven. Seven. Seven? One. one. Who said one? That man there wins the, wins the prize. One acre of wood. That's it. One acre of wood. We got a lot of one acres of wood around here that we can heat a lot of homes with. And the other, it's a responsible choice if we burn it with very little or no, no smoke. You can come by any one of our shops. We could have two or three wood stoves going. You may smell it in the air when you walk into the store, but you won't see any smoke coming out of the stacks outside of our stores. So, what is, a re I want to talk about renewable energy. And what is a renewable energy resource? And I want you guys to feel good about burning wood because it is one. And we talk about, uh, you know, hydro, uh, electric power, of course, solar power, um, you know, taking the rays of the sun, converting it into electricity or heat, um, wind turbines, Obviously, taking the wind and create, creating, uh, creating electricity with it, and uh, biomass or wood. I may say biomass a lot tonight. It's like the in term for wood or pellets or corn or whatever. Um, but basically, we're meeting wood um, when we're talking about that. Now, why why is why is biomass or wood a, a you know renewable energy resource? Um, and basically what we talk about with wood is, on the right side of my uh, chart here, if we, if we take the, the light from the sun, we're going back to like grade nine science class here. Uh, we're gonna take the, the rays from the sun, we're gonna grow a tree. When that tree dies, it decomposes and it adds the same carbon it, it absorbed while it was growing, it goes back into the atmosphere. Scientists across the world, whether you believe in global warming or not, or climate change, scientists across the world undisputedly say we as humans are carbon loading the atmosphere. We're adding extra carbon to the atmosphere. That's an undisputed fact. So with wood, we don't add extra carbon because we grow it, we collect the carbon here, and we burn it, we release the same carbon back into the atmosphere. Then if we grow trees again, it's the same cycle that keeps going. So whether a tree dies in the forest or whether we burn it in our house, we're releasing the same carbon back into the atmosphere. So, you know, it should feel good when you're, when you're burning wood or pellets in your home. So there's, in order to do this properly, there's three main components that we're concerned about. The wood burning system, which is the wood stove. And you guys see my little wood stove here? It's kind of funky. Uh, if you put a hot fire in here, though, it melts. So <laughs> we don't recommend that. But when you come up later, you can take a look at a modern burning wood stove and, and what things you can see in it. Um, the appliance in the chimney system, the fuel, the fuel is important. Uh, number one complaint about a wood system not working properly, number one complaint, the fuel. I can't tell you how many houses I've gone to, sat in their living room, and within half an hour had them peeling off the three sweaters they had when I walked in um, because of the fuel that they had and just too much moisture content in it. But never tell anyone they have bad firewood. I've learned that. <laughs> you might as well have taken their kids away. You know, like it's, <laughs> firewood is a very, we, we, talk about, we talk about tips and techniques to a drying proper firewood. Uh, we never tell people they have bad firewood. Um, and of course the user and how you're fueling the stove and how, and how you're, you're, you're getting it going. So, so far so good? Nobody's fallen asleep yet? No? We're good? Okay. If you have any questions, like I said, uh, just raise your hands up. So, the appliance, uh, which can be a stove, fireplace, or central heater. So, when we talk about wood stoves, we talk about, I saw a great picture of an old Canuck tonight. That's, you know, we would talk about a conventional wood stove. They're, the old wood stoves, if I back up a bit, in, in the mid to late 70s, um, the government had the first, what we call, first off oil program. And uh, they incented people to get onto other fuels 
uh, electricity was one of them and wood was another one. So back then, uh, growing up, of course, my dad got an old Fisher wood stove, put it in the basement. Uh, I think at the time the government gave you 25 or 30 percent of your purchase price for the stove. Um, and a lot of those conventional, you know, the, the birth of the airtight, as everybody calls it. Of course, if you have an airtight wood stove, the wood won't burn because you need air to burn wood. But, you know, it's a common term here. Um, advanced technology, EPA certified wood stoves that burn cleanly. And I'm going to talk about that as well. We're going to talk about both and what the difference is. Because like I said earlier, wood stoves last a long time. Um, you know, you just, they, just, they don't wear out like, like some things. So, what does a conventional wood stove look like? Does anybody have one of those in their house? No, not too many of those old pot bellies left. What about an old Finley cook stove? Yeah, a few people? Big Crown Place, Ontario. Any convection heaters? Don't see them too much around here. Yeah, we got one guy back there. Uh, the old sort of parlor kind of stoves. Anybody with those? Yeah? And then uh, more of a, a air, what we call an airtight, or uh, you know something like that. Any anybody with still an old airtight like Canuck, uh, Fisher, Odette, Canada, they're common ones here. Yeah. So what's different with an advanced combustion wood stove? How does it physically look different? Well, the first thing you're going to notice is there's this wonderful glass door in the front here where you can see the fire. And, and it may be cast iron, like you see this one over here, or steel, or it could be, in this case, made of soapstone. Um, but you're gonna, the, the big thing you're going to see, the difference, is, is the glass. Okay, still, skill testing question. What is the glass made of? Ceramic. ceramic. Yeah, it's actually not glass. It's a clear ceramic. They developed it, developed it for the space shuttle program. And once NASA spent a billion dollars on a piece of glass so that the astronauts could look out, they sold it to our industry. <laughs> and that's what's in your wood stove. Yeah, I got all these stupid little facts I'll fill you in on. Good trivia questions. Pellet stoves. Anybody here heat with a pellet stove? Ah, we got a few pellet people in the audience. Um, pellet stoves, I'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, can come in a variety of different looks, often looking like a wood stove, or uh, uh, the one up in the top left would look like a maybe an old oil burner or something as well. But once again, we are still burning wood here. A different form of wood, we're still burning it. And conventional, anybody have like an old-fashioned fireplace at home? Open wood-burning fireplace. Um, a lot of these, we see a lot of these in the area. Um, produce a lot of smoke. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And not terribly efficient. Um, the CMHC studies have shown that an open masonry fireplace, like the one, the one here on our right, um, once we get this going, it goes from plus 10% to minus 5% efficient. Because when you go to bed at night and you leave the damper open, all that air goes up the chimney. But we can talk about uh, what can change that, and that's this right here, a fireplace insert. So we can take that old, inefficient, put a wood stove insert in there, and uh, convert it. And we're going to be dropping the liners down to do that. So there are high efficiency advanced technology fireplaces. Um, and once again, what they're doing is, is they're reburning the smoke before it goes out the flue. You'll often see a nice clean glass and you know you put in an armful of wood, and it's going to burn for hours and hours like a, like a wood stove. Anybody here with a masonry heater? No, okay. Not very common in our neck of the woods, but if you lived in Scandinavia, you would see these all over the place. Uh, we have one set up in our Kingston showroom. Probably the most efficient way to burn wood. What happens is uh, you burn it wide open. We have a 17-foot flame path, so the flame actually goes through the brick and then up through the chimney. When the fire goes out, we pull a damper across the top of the chimney and the whole thing radiates heat. You have one fire a day for about an hour and a half and it'll heat your house. As long as it's located in the right spot in the middle of the house. So, pretty interesting. Yeah. Any, any people here with wood burning furnaces or boilers inside the house? Yeah. So traditionally, 
wood burning furnaces are not very efficient. They'll gobble a lot of wood or boilers. Um, but a lot of people like the idea because we can spread the, you know, with the wood stove, we're heating the space it's in with a furnace, we can get the wood heat throughout the house. Any outdoor boilers? Yeah. Outdoor boilers um, can sometimes be a little contentious in, in some areas around Kingston. They are banned, you can't put them in. Um, a little contentious because it's difficult to make them burn cleanly, but we do have some new manufacturers doing that now. Um, yes? Why are they banned around Kingston? Well, in certain municipalities, what's happened is, and I'd have to say the location of the, of the outdoor boiler is not in a smart spot. You've got neighbors close by. You've got this thing that smokes. Great for a farm, and it's off in the back 40. Um, not so great when your neighbor's 50 feet away. So I would say if they were installed properly, it may not have been an issue. So what has changed in wood burning technology to make things more efficient? Who here wants to burn less wood for the same amount of heat? <laughs> oh, there's a surprise. <laughs> So what's happening is that we are looking at extracting the maximum amount of heat out of the wood before it hits the flue. And what we do is we actually bake the wood and burn the smoke. Here's an interesting fact. 60 to 70% of the heat in this stick of wood is in the smoke. 60 to 70 percent of the heat in this stick of wood is in the smoke. So if we can burn the smoke off, we can burn less wood for the same amount of heat. Who here, I grew up with one, but who here has had an old wood stove with a, with a, uh, a pipe damper? Or had one or has one? And did you ever notice how the pipe, when the pipe damper's closed, may get really red hot? It was almost like a great heat exchanger. But what was happening is that smoke was getting burned off right there. And that's why it was so hot. So by burning the smoke off, we can, we can get more heat out of the same amount of wood. So, and this was discovered in the late 1970s by a couple of upper state New York hippies that were hanging out and real smart guys, but dropped out of society and tried to figure out how to burn wood more efficiently. So there was two types of technologies that came into effect. Uh, one was catalytic and non-cat. Has anybody here heard of catalytic burning wood stoves, heard that technology? Does anybody know what a catalytic converter is on the exhaust of their vehicle? Okay. So a company here in Ontario called Lakewood, I don't know if anybody here owned a Lakewood wood stove, but a Lakewood wood, Lakewood wood stoves in the uh, mid-1980s came up with this concept of putting a catalyst in the stove, you can see it right here. Oh, sorry, you can see it right here in the top of the stove. Putting a catalyst. So, so for those who don't know what a catalyst is, basically what it does. Uh, if you remember grade ten science class, catalytic um, in chemistry class, I guess, a catalytic reaction. What we're doing is we're taking the smoke and we're introducing um, it through the catalyst, and it has material in it that allows the smoke to burn off at a low temperature, right? And that's what the catalytic converter does in our cars, basically allows us to pass our emission test so we don't have to pay that big fine, right? So if it's working properly, we don't get smoke coming out. And uh, what tends to happen is we have this really hot part of the fire up around the catalyst. The drawback of catalytic combustors is we've got to make sure that what we're burning here is good, clean dry wood or good, clean newspaper. We don't want to introduce any extra chemicals, printed newspaper, uh, wood with nails in it, that sort of thing to it. So this was actually an Ontario company that came up with this concept. The non-cat wood stove was developed by those two guys in northern New York State. Um, and what they came up with was... Rather than having a catalyst, and this is what my lovely plastic wood stove does up here, is we're going to bring air in, 
We're going to superheat the air. We're going to inject it into the secondary tubes or baffles like you see up here. And by the time it gets up here, it's going to be so hot that it's going to burn that smoke off. Remember, 60 to 70% of the heat in wood is not in the solid material, it's in the smoke. It's in the gases. So, nothing like a wood fire. I hope this makes you feel warmer tonight. But if you take a look up here, and we see this little swirling stuff happening at the top of the firebox, that's what we're doing. And in a modern non-cat wood stove, if you shut it down, all the way, what will happen is you'll see that the wood here goes out and the air stays on fire. Does anybody here have a non-cat wood stove and seen that phenomenon? Yeah. It'll be blue, it'll be purple, it'll be a really hot, hot flame. And here's the big thing. And this is why about 15 years ago, we, I spent a lot of time in Toronto because the Lung Association were trying to shut down wood burning, believe it or not. On Bay Street, we were there uh, explaining to them, they had a lot of clout. The people, you know, the guys in the provincial government thought, oh, you just burn wood in a cottage. And we were trying to tell them, no, there's like a million homes in Ontario with wood burning in it. So um, this, is, this is what they, they were worried about is a conventional wood stove like a Fisher, a Kanata, the Canuck that we saw tonight, we're emitting about 60 grams per hour of emissions. So our efficiency is about 40 to 50 percent at best. On a modern EPA, or you know, a wood stove that burns the smoke off, we're two to five grams. We actually have wood stoves down under two grams per hour emissions. So a phenomenal difference in the amount of emissions going in. So that's why I said before, if you see smoke coming out, you're not burning very, very cleanly. So we went from like 40 to 50 percent efficient, and we're up upwards close to 80 percent. On the modern wood stove. Could be cat, could be non cat, doesn't matter. And this is true. If you go from an old airtight wood stove, could be a Franklin, could be a Fisher, and we go to a modern uh, stove that burns the smoke off, we're going to save a third of the wood we burn. And I know that fact because I used to hump wood into my dad's wood stove. <laughs> and it was a Fisher, and we went through seven full cords a year. And when he switched over to the uh, Pacific Energy Wood Stove he has now, we cut that right down. It was unbelievable. And I had to do the work because I was a teenager. So maybe that's why I got into this industry. I'm not sure. Um, I mentioned before clean burning furnaces. So a lot of furnaces are, are just fire boxes and they don't have that secondary burn technology. But what's happened in the last few years, we're seeing outdoor boilers and furnaces that will have that same effect in the upper chamber where it's burning that smoke off, right? So outdoor boilers, a lot of people say it's great because it'll heat multiple buildings, but it's not so great because it gobbles a lot of wood. Well, they are getting a lot better. And we had a few people with wood pellets. Put your hands up again, wood pellet people. Great. So, what are wood pellets? And I've got some here if you want to see them. I should hand some of this out. Pass this around so everybody can take a look. Um, Wood pellets are compressed sawdust. We take sawdust from a lumber mill, and I'm going to hand out some, uh, not all wood pellets, these are some switchgrass here. There's some Tim Hortons pellets, that, that's uh, from Kingston Tim Hortons. We're working with St. Lawrence College to heat the college with uh, pelletized coffee grinds. Um, but what we're doing is we're basically taking sawdust, we are compressing it, we use the natural resins in the woods. So there's no additives, no preservatives, no wax, no nothing but 100% wood. And we're putting it through a big spaghetti machine, and we get pellets at the other end. And they come in bags like the one down front here, 40 pound bags. What's great about a pellet stove is that it has an auger feeding system. Think of it like a little grain auger. This auger turns on and off delivers so many pounds per hour to our burn area. That's how we, reg we can regulate the amount of fuel we're burning, you know. Because like I say with wood, when you got a wood stove, when you put in that log, it's Shakespeare. Have you guys heard that? It's Shakespeare? Burning wood is much like Shakespeare. You guys didn't know that? Yeah. To throw in the log or to not throw in the log? That is always the question, right? <laughs> always the question. 
with pellets, it's a lot easier because I can just set my dial and it'll, that auger will just feed. Then there's a, a heat exchanger up here and a fan that moves the heat through the house. So it's still burning wood, uh, just a different way of doing it. So what kind of wood are those pellets are made of? Those pellets will be made of any wood that the sawmill is cutting. So it could be anything. It could be soft wood, it could be hard wood. Yeah, yeah, in fact, soft wood. I know I'm going to blow your mind now. You ready? Another interesting, stupid fact in the back of my brain. Softwood per pound, per pound, has a higher BTU or higher heat content than hardwood. Sounds weird. Well, that's right. But we're, we're measuring it per pound, not per, per core. Um, so yeah, softwood, hardwood. We have uh, pellet uh, smokers that we sell, which are made of applewood and cherry. And I smoked Christmas turkey this year, and I was very popular in my house for about 12 hours. Um, so yeah, so pellets are, um, yeah, they're just a combination of woods, whatever, you know, typically we see them in lumbering. Lumbering mills before were creating sawdust and then just dumping them in swamps or burning the sawdust. They had no, no use for it. It was garbage. Now they're pelletizing it and selling it out there. So it's good. It's sort of you're capturing that garbage in a sense. Biomass burners. They're called biomass and the stuff I handed around is the stuff the biomass burners would burn. And um, like I said before, we're working with St. Lawrence College in Kingston on a local initiative. Um, guess how many, how much, here's another fun thing to do. How much coffee grinds per week in the city of Kingston at the Tim Hortons? <laughs> It's about 40 tons. That's Kingston. Now we have a lot of Tim Hortons in Kingston, I know. Um, so yeah, so you know, I was approached by the folks at St. Lawrence College and they're looking at, they have a renewable energy program there and trying to think of some creative ways for the kids and, and some local business has got this idea to, to put this thing together. And you'll see them, the, the black pellets going around, they're, uh, they're the Tim Hortons pellets. Um, so these stoves were, are designed to burn, not just that, but uh, you've got some switchgrass pellets up hand around. Uh, there was a local initiative down here to burn hemp a few years ago. Um, corn, wheat, barley, you name it. Um, what's fundamentally different is it does have the delivery system, but in the burn area, we have an agitator breaking up the, the, the ash. Why we burn wood is it's very small ash content, less than 1% ash. That's why we burn wood. And when we get into the other fuels, we can get 8 9% ash content and we have to deal with it. So these stoves are also available. They can burn pellets. Um, popular with farmers grow an extra three acres of corn and they can heat their house for the year. Okay. Now we get to talk about codes. And why your insurance company asks you get your wood stove checked, did you say to them, but it's been here for 50 years, there's nothing wrong with it. And they insist that you get it checked. Um, so there's lots of codes around chimney. And when we talk about chimney, we're talking about this stainless steel stuff. To, to, to break it down, we have shiny stuff and we have black stuff with the wood stove. Uh, the black stuff is, is our, is our um, our smoke pipe, once I hand this stuff around, you can see it. And um, the chimney is what takes the smoke up through the house or out the wall and up. The smoke pipe takes it to the chimney. We have codes around, oops, codes around um, floor pods. Everybody here has a floor pad, non-combustible surface under their stoves, right? Thank you. I have seen wood stoves installed on hardwood flooring. The customer wondered why they were getting little pot marks in front of their stove. Um, so there's codes around this. We gotta have to have 18 inches in front of the stove and eight inches off the side. And that's a code in Canada. So our smoke pipe, double wall or single wall, takes the smoke from the stove to the chimney, and then uh, the chimney takes it there on up. All wood stoves have different clearances. There's usually a label on the back of your stove that will tell you what those clearances are. Every wood stove is individually tested in Canada for clearances. 
Yeah. Advantages and disadvantages of single wall or double wall chimneys. Great question. Advantages or disadvantages of single wall or double wall smoke pipe. So everybody here knows what single wall smoke pipe is. It goes together, crimps together, and has this interlocking thing. Um, so we have single wall smoke pipe because we've always had it. And once something is in the code, it's often hard to get it out. So single wall smoke pipe has to be built to 27 gauge sheet metal or thicker. Okay? So basically just a thickness. We're measuring to a thickness. Double wall smoke pipe has the same stainless steel interior as your chimney does. So it's built to a thermal shock not to a thickness. Making sense so far? Okay, so the fundamental difference is thickness will wear out. Thermal shock, if we have a chimney fire, heaven forbid you have a chimney fire, it's not very pleasant. The stainless steel inside the chimney and the stainless steel inside that piece I handed you around will withstand that chimney fire. Okay, so in Canada, we have yeah, I should have said this off the bat. We have the strictest wood stove standards in the world here in Canada. Do you know that in Canada, remember how I said we had to have 18 inches in front? Our sparks fly 18 inches. In the States, they fly 16 inches. <laughs> so you know, yes. Uh, the single pipe, you say there's a possibility of a chimney fire. Uh, any, any, any time you have a wood stove, there's a possibility of a chimney yeah. fire. That the double pipe secures that? So he's asking if the double pipe secures that. The double double wall pipe, the interior, if you look in the inside of it, you're gonna see shiny stainless. That stainless is made of a certain type of stainless steel that's designed to withstand a chimney fire. Okay? So if you have a, if you have a chimney fire in there, it's gonna keep the pipe intact. So it's not compulsory to have the double pipe though, is it? It's not compulsory. That's why we bring up both up here. Like I said, we have single wall smoke pipe because we've always had it. And once something's in the code, trust me, I've tried getting some weird stuff taken out of the code and they just, you know, once it's there, it's, it's like it's there. So, yeah. Yes? So the only reason you would suggest double walled pipe would be because of a chance of a, um, of a chimney fire. The only reason they get double wall pipe chance of chimney fire. That's one reason. The other is your wood stove will be able to get closer to the wall. A wood stove with double wall smoke pipe on it has closer clearances to combustible materials. So we can get it closer to our drywall, closer to our barn board. And it's much safer. It's much, much safer because heaven forbid has anybody here ever heard of chimney fire? Put your hand up if you have. It's it's a 747 landing on your roof. It's not fun, right? And if you take single wall pipe and if it's not put together very well, it could pop apart. 2100 degree fire in something that's 27 gauge thick could affect it. So the recommendations are usually if you have single wall smoke pipe, you should be replacing that every three years, four years, five years. Yeah. And I bet you happen. Because I know that my grandfather's farm they have. Yes. No, there's not insulation between those two layers. That's Remember, this is a smoke pipe. So if this is our stove, it's going from the stove up to our chimney. Right? It's the black stuff, and then the silver stuff has the insulation. Yes? So the, the, how often would you change the double pipe? Or do you, do you well, for example, the stuff we sell at our store is guaranteed for life. Right? So, and I've seen chimney fires come out of them, and they're... Friendly fires in Peterborough, Coburg, Kingston, or Crumbly. <laughs> Anyone you want to come to, we will have it for you. All right. So, if we're going to change our system, and what we consider a change, and the, I should back up. So, the codes in Ontario all stem from the Ontario Building Code. Ontario Building Code says... Uh, whatever it says, it's law. It's, it's passed by Parliament. It is law. So when, they, when the building inspector gives you heck because you're not building it to the code, it's because it's the law and he's the law enforcement officer for that code. Now, the Ontario Building Code can take some interpretation, right? 
Um, in Ontario Building Code, it references uh, a CSA code ca called B365. That code is what gives us direction on how to install wood stoves. And in that, if you get a modern wood stove or modern chimney, it'll have installation instructions. And those instructions, because they're referenced by the code, are actually law. So, when they're, when they're giving you a hack of it, installing your wood stove, and it's been there forever, if it doesn't meet those codes, that's what the insurance company's getting at. So if you make a change, and we're talking a significant change, if you change your single wall smoke pipe, you don't need a permit. But if you go to change your wood stove or your chimney, you're supposed to get a permit. Um, permit is, is by your local building inspector, and uh, it's typically anywhere from <laughs> You know, fifty to one hundred fifty dollars, depending on the jurisdiction, and um, that is something you should be doing when you're switching to when you're switching into wood stove. And also, um, you you probably want to let your insurance company know as well. And you want to check with your insurance company. Although your home is your castle, you can do anything you want inside of it. You know, if you want to install a wood stove yourself, you can. That's not a problem. They may ask for you to have a wet certified person come out and make sure it's done properly, right? And why they do that is so that if something happens, they can sue me and my company and get their money back, right? Okay. How many people here, by a show of hands, use a bucket like this? How many people here, by a show of hands, has a wood stove? There's a big difference there. Um, if you talk to anybody in the fire marshal's office of Ontario, the number one reason for wood stove fires, take a guess. Number one, ashes. Ashes should be put in a steel bucket. The steel bucket should have a nice tight fitting lid. And it should have a double bottom like you're going to see on that one. $60. Come by and get one. No. Um, best investment you can make. This is the number one reason why people's houses burn down from wood. Yes, sir. How long are those bushes supposed to stay in there? Until they're cold. Well, I'll go every week. Yes. It is a problem, right? So that's why we often talk about putting it on a concrete pad or something when you go outside, because it's going to take a long time for them to cool down. <laughs> Anybody want some ashes, we have a man, and he'll be at the back later. He'll sell them to you for cheap. Yes. Um, garbage bags and cardboard boxes are the result of most fires from wood stoves, because people put their ashes in the I am not joking. I saw the statistics over five years and it was mind blowing. Garbage bags. Garbage, I couldn't believe it. Anyways, it's true. So, you should have a, a lid with a, a, a double bottom ash bucket with a tight fitting lid. It'll help smother the fire. Oh, I got a question for you. Yeah. In advertising now, places like Old Hardware, they have stainless steel vacuum cleaners for your fireplace. Stainless steel vacuum cleaners for your fireplace. Oof. Yeah. They're called ash vacuums. Yeah, so if you read the print on the box, it says that your ashes have to be cold. Okay, and I don't know, I burnt wood once or twice in my life. And it takes a while for them to cool down. They're great with pellet stoves, phenomenal with pellet stoves. Because a pellet stove. It is designed to, to burn out completely before the stove shuts off. The ashes are completely out. You can vacuum them out. They're not, yeah. yeah don't, so your coals don't blow up for two days. And don't. That time your house is cold, you lit another fire, right? I'd love, I'd love to sell you one, but I won't sell you one for a wood stove. Thank you. Okay. So, who here has a smoke alarm, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide? Good. Carbon dioxide? Monoxide, monoxide, good. And everybody here, of course, has multiple fire extinguishers. Okay, these are required 
by the fire code. Okay, so we, we fall under the building code, and then there's a, a fire code that the firefighters follow, and it talks about having all of this in your house if you're burning wood. So it's important to make sure you have that as well. Okay? Wet. So let's talk about wet for a second, because doesn't it sound weird that we're talking about wood burning and somebody's wet certified? It's a weird acronym. Never figured it out. What WET does is, WET is a national not-for-profit organization. This organization trains people across Canada so that they can interpret this convoluted code and tell you how to install things according to the code. We pay a lot of money to get WET certified. I have to apprentice for 80 weeks to get WET certified. I have to do an ongoing test every five years to maintain my certification. Um, so wet certified people will come in and they'll comment whether something is installed according to code or not. Or they're wet certified installers and they'll install something to make sure it is according to code. They're not going to tell you it's safe. They're going to tell you it's installed according to the code and that's what the insurance company is looking for. So a lot of people will say, is this stove wet certified? Or is this installation wet certified? No, people are wet certified, installations are not. They're code compliant, or they're not code compliant. So everything to us is about the code. Does that make sense? Okay. But the insurance company will say, I need a wet letter for that wood stove you just put in. Okay, because that's, I don't know why they say that they do. So you phone up a, you know, you get on their website, wetink.ca, or give uh, Anthony a call at the office, and they can direct you to somebody in your area that's wet certified. Make sense? Nodding heads? Yes, at the back. Some of those stickers, uh, they fall off sometimes and they've been around for a while because of the heat. And if you misplace it and you try to get a wet certification, you can get one. Some of the stickers on the stove might fall off after a while or overheat. You're absolutely 100% correct. Mm -hmm. And if those stickers fall off, I would say a reasonable wet certified person would recognize this double wall smoke pipe and they would say, okay, this is brand X. Here's the installation manual, keep that close by. Um, so that's, I mean, that's between a reasonable person and maybe someone who's trying to be, you know, A++ in his class or something. Um, it does happen, it is, it is common, but most wet certified people will look through that. Does that make sense? I mean, that's how we would approach it. <laughs> yeah, that sucks. Yeah. Stone labels rarely fall off. I've seen it happen on the old ones from the early to mid 80s. Um, that can happen, but any stove label from, I want to say, 90 on should be fine. But yeah, you're right. Older stoves, 100%. And then the problem with older stoves is we can't find them on the internet because the companies aren't around anymore. You know, so that's the sort of stuff. I mean, reasonable people will do reasonable things to make sure it's done right, so if that makes sense. Okay. Who here, a lot of wood burners in the room. Let's pass this around. Who here has one of these at home? Okay, okay. Who here has a wet certified chimney sweep come out and clean their chimney? Okay. <laughs> I think tomorrow we're going to have a sale on brushes and ash buckets. Um, you need to clean your chimney once a year. It is required by the fire code. The fire marshal's office says you have to have someone physically clean your chimney once a year. Could be yourself. Um, but you have to have someone clean it. Who here... Here, this is going to be fun. Who here has gone to one of the mass merchants and bought a chimney sweeping log and used it in their fireplace or wood stove? Oh, one. Okay. You guys all get an A+. Plus. If you get a chimney sweeping log and you read the big print, it says blah, 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 blah. And then you flip it around and read the small print and it just recants everything it said in the big print. Um, there was a great marketplace episode you probably downloaded online that they, they, they took a chimney system, they took it apart, took pictures of it, put it together, 
use a chimney sweeping log, took it apart, took pictures, put it together, and then had people actually clean the chimney, took it apart, and the chimney sweeping log did nothing. nothing. Yeah, the back there. Potato peels, flour, salt, um, parsnip. Yes. Yes. I used to put potato peels in our fisher at home. Yeah. You need you need a brush. Like this is carbon. Carbon forms on pipe and brick, and you have to brush it off. You just have to. It uh, it forms like if you have an old clay tile, it'll form like this, and it's only a brush that's going to knock that. Or you could hire little gremlins to go down in there, <laughs> and they might get it off for you. I don't know, but yeah, you got, you got to sweep it. And this is this is really important. Whether you do it yourself or you have someone in to do it, see that not only if you do it yourself, you're going to see like if you have a clay tile chimney. And how many here have a brick with a clay tile chimney? In it? Yeah, clay tile chimneys they could they could get cracks in them, and just getting up there and seeing the state of that, you know, preventative measures to what's going on with it if you see something going on. That's when you get somebody to put a liner in. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's right. If, I mean, if you start seeing this deteriorate and fall apart, then you're going to have to address it and put a liner in. Yeah. So, once a year, make sure you're getting someone or yourself to go out and, and, uh, and sweep your chimney. Okay. Who here has a gasket on the door of their wood stove? Who here has done the $5 test on the gasket on the door of their wood stove? Oh, we got one Peter right there. Um, so the $5, it used to be the $1 test, and then we got rid of the, then it was a $2 test, and now it's the $5 test. Basically what it is, is you put the $5 bill, stove has to be off, <laughs> the $5 bill, close the door, and then pull the bill and see, it, it should come out, but it should be really hard to come out. And that'll tell you whether your gasket is sealing properly. And that's important for proper wood stove uh, because we want to make sure we're, the, the, the air is coming into the stove where, where, where it should be. Okay? Yeah? I'm going to ask you a question about the gasket in terms of asbestos. Is that evolved or are we still using asbestos? The question is, are we still using asbestos in gasket? You think the government would let me sell you asbestos? I don't know. Uh, no. That's what I'm asking. No, it's fiberglass. Fiberglass, okay. Yeah. Thank you. All the gaskets are fiberglass. And there'll be different grades. You'll see white. Uh, the package I sit around is the gray. The gray has a graphite in it, which tends to last a little bit longer. You pay a little bit more for it, but you know either one's going to be fine as long as you keep an eye on that, keep maintaining. And you also want to check your door latches. You know we're opening and closing that door four or five times a day, so that five dollar bill test all the way around the door will tell you if things are sealing well and the stove's burning right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, some stoves will have a manifold at the back of the gasket. Yeah, you want to check all the gaskets. They're all going to be a little bit different, for sure. Like a manifold on the back of the stove, it's a one door. Yeah, yeah. So, firewood. The ugliest looking firewood is the best stuff you can burn. <laughs> I love this picture. It's a friend of mine's firewood that he had this is a few, 10 years ago now, 10, 15 years ago. And that, when I see that, I get really excited because I know there's no moisture left in that. When we burn wood, the first thing we do is we boil the water in. So we're testing some firewood up here. And I have to say, everybody had great firewood today. We want to be around 20% or less moisture content. So, remember, I said the first thing we do is we boil the water out when we're burning wood. So if we have 10 pounds of wood we put in here, and good moisture content is 20%, we got two pounds of water. Okay, makes sense. If we go to 25%, you go 25%, 5% more, no big deal. We got two and a half pounds of water to boil out, right? Or 25% more water. So it can really, really inhibit the stove from working properly. And you'll know because it'll start hissing at you and bubbling and, and, and shooting water at you. That's when you know. It's not working properly. How big is a quart of wood? Anybody? Four by four by eight. 
So weights and measurements can are only recognized as a four by four by eight as a cord of wood. But of course, you know, a phase cord is considered one one row of that or one third of one third of that. So a good question earlier, someone's asked to me, husband and wife are arguing about uh, how to store their, their firewood. Different the different hardness of the firewood will determine how long we have to dry the wood. So for example, cedar will take or pine, because it's a very you know low density wood, will take quicker to dry than rock elm, hard maple, red oak, ironwood. But generally speaking, we're going to cut one year for the next. General rule of thumb. And when we cut, what we mean by that is not in eight foot logs this big around. We mean cut the length and split. The sun needs to get at this. See how dark that is? The sun needs to bake that. That hot July and August sun is what does that. It's good to get it up off the ground if we can. You guys have probably had uh, it right on the ground and then the bottom row is no good because it gets all moisture from the ground. Um, but we need to cut it. We need to get it out in the July and August sun and then when the rains start in September, we want to get it inside then or get it under tarps or something so it doesn't pick up that surface moisture. If we do that, typically we will be at that 20% moisture content. It's not complicated. Now, if you get into iron wood, it's going to take probably two years because you're not probably going to split it because I hate splitting iron. I can't split iron wood. It's just too hard. I think most of us here, how to tell if wood is dry. We're going to have nice cracking, right? Dark, like I'm showing you the piece over there. And, you know, what my grandfather taught me when I was a kid, you take two pieces, you pound them together, and you're going to hear it either go thud or twang. Twang's good, thud's bad. Or, if you want to get real fancy like I did, you go to Lee Valley, you spend $89, you can get a moisture meter, and you can test the wood. It's important, though, um, that you, you split the wood open and test the heart of the wood because that's where the moisture is going to be. It'll be gone from the surface once we want to check the, the, uh, the heart of it. And like I said before, if it hisses too much, it's, it's just too wet. Yes, sir? Bark up or bark down. What's the theory? I see bark up there. Yeah, bark up or bark down. How about no bark at all? Oh, that's perfect. I like that. Yeah. Number one thing that causes ashes in your wood stove. Bark. Number one thing that has no very little heat content. Bark. You can get that bark off. That's yeah. If we we the bark. I mean this is uh, birch, but if we get that bark off, it's gonna dry your wood a lot faster. A lot faster. Yes, sir. I've got a question. I I don't cut big big trees anymore because I hate splitting wood. So I cut them small. And how long is that wood gonna take? Dry as a unit, as opposed to splitting. Yes, opposed to splitting wood, if you just cut like limb wood. <laughs> yeah, that's my, you know, growing up, we always called that limb wood. Okay. Um, so, limb wood's going to take a little longer because we're not exposing the heart to the sun. Okay. So it may take a couple of years. But you're going to be wanting to look for this sort of stuff oh, on the ends. Okay. Here. Once you see that, we know we're we're getting into the right area. Thank you. Okay. Okay, do's and don'ts. Do, burn, clean, season, hardwood, and just enough newspaper to get it lit. Okay? Do not put pressure treated wood in your wood stove. Or railway ties. Yes, or one customer five years ago was burning tires. <laughs> don't do that. Okay, we don't have to worry about salt water wood around here. A plywood. We don't want anything with glue. Yes, people put garbage in their wood stove. Then they call us and say it's not working properly and start pulling cans out of the top capillary. <laughs> yes, this is true. Don't burn it, please. It's not covered under the manufacturer's warranty. Um, yeah, wood stoves are designed to burn wood. Period. 
Anybody see any of this stuff around? Let me hand that around. Metal off the boat. Yeah. Fantastically hot wood. It is awesome stuff. It's great to burn outside when you're having your fires. You know, that's the place to use those. If you use that in a modern wood stove, you avoid the warmth. What is that? It is compressed logs. Okay? Compressed logs of, of sawdust. Some of them will have wax binding agents in them. Um, what we want to put in our wood stoves is wood. We don't put wood in our oil stoves. We don't put oil in our wood stoves. Right? We want to keep wood. We want just enough newspaper to get it lit. Good hot fire. Cardboard and paper products. Cardboard can have a lot of uh, tape and stuff on it. And the reason why we don't want to do this is when we burn wood, the smoke travels in a circular upward direction. And the carbon mixing with any chemicals or any, if it's cold, any water, will create creosote. That's it. It's carbon and water, carbon and chemicals, and that creates creosote. Creosote creates chimney fires. So why we don't want to burn this stuff is we don't want your house to burn down. It's just good safety, that's all. It's not, we're not trying to be jerks. It's just, we, we just don't want you to burn your house down. Okay. So how do we burn fires without making a lot of smoke? Who here owns a rake? And by a rake, I mean a piece, a tool that you can reach in and rake your coals forward. Oh, that's great. That's great. So when you're burning wood, what we want to do is we want to bring our coal. Our coals, our, our, our wood stoves tend to burn from the front to the back. We get ashes in the front in the morning. We get coals in the back. So who here has ever had a problem with all of a sudden I got so many coals in my fire that I can't put any wood in it? Yeah, I have. It happens. So what we have to do, we have to learn to burn in cycles. We need to rake those coals forward. We need to put wood on top of those coals to burn them off. Yes, sir. Yeah, but at the same time, I do suggest that if you stick your whatever you do it with into the coal and work it up very slowly. And I'll tell you, anybody who does that with the window open, you'll find it's going to be hot. Yes. And I... I for this is the wrong thing. It seems to me that I'm not even burning wood, even though I go through five, six, four every winter. How the so? The flames are always dancing a little bit above the wood. Yeah, exactly. I never burn wood. Yeah. I You're burning the smoke. You're burning the smoke. Saying that. I haven't cleaned the chimney for 12 years. <laughs> you look at it though, right? I check every. Perfect. <laughs> you may not clean your chimney, but you got to look at it. Nothing in it. If you burn it right, there will be nothing in it. So I'm not saying you have to get it. You got to check it. That's yes, sir. Is there one kind of wood that burns down more than others? <laughs> the one kind of wood. That's probably the million-dollar question. One kind of wood that burns down more than others. That's a tough one. Uh, soft woods tend to burn down more than hard woods. So if if you've ever had a big load of coals in there. Easiest way to try to get them out of there is to rake your coals forward, take a nice piece of dry cedar or pine, place it across the coals, shut your door, and walk away for 20 minutes, half an hour, and let it consume itself. The, for whatever reason, it just tends to just consume and, and burn that those, those coals down. Burning in cycles, um, which means... Load your wood stove up, you, you let it burn, house gets warm, as we all know, it starts to cool down, and then we reload it again. So a proper wood stove's heat cycle will go like this, look like a nice sine wave. If we put logs in all day and just smolder it, uh, we're, not, we're not burning the water, boiling the water up, we're not burning the smoke off, we're just smoldering and creating a, creating a hazard. And Using smaller loads in the, in, the, in the milder weather makes sense, you know. Everybody, some people say, oh, I don't like softwoods. Well, softwoods are great in spring and fall. They're fantastic. Throw in a handful of cedar, get a nice hot fire, let it go out. The house is warm, 
right? Um, or let the space cool a little bit before you load it. Then it will force you to do that heating cycle like we were just talking about. And get it nice and hot before you turn it down. So, we should be flaming the fire until we get down to charcoal. And we don't want to smolder like we we're just talking. We want a nice, we want sort of thin looking flames or like you're saying, you know, the gas is on fire above, above the wood. I don't know if you can see the bottom there, everybody, but um, the whole idea of raking your coals forward. You know, when you get up in the morning, the coals are typically in the back. You rake it forward and then reload your wood on top of it. Um, that'll help reduce and create that, that uh, the reduction of the, of the coals as well. And then, um, you know, burning your wood in cycles, let the space cool, and, you know, like we are just saying, it's in, in, in milder weather, smaller loads. And smaller loads could be like three or four pieces crisscrossed. Uh, bigger loads in the, in the, in the wintertime is usually when we're putting, you know, the bigger blocks in there to sustain the fire all night. And it is best for wood burning to let the space cool. If we let it cool down, we'll fire it hot again. When we fire it hot, we get the chimney warm and the smoke travels up through there. Next. And when you reload in the morning or at night at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you leave your draft open and you get that fire rigorously going. If you ever go to a website called woodheat.org, Nonprofit website talks all about wood burning. And there's some great videos on there showing, you know, what I'm sort of trying to illustrate with these slides. Who here has seen smoke come from their chimney other than startup of their wood stove? Nobody's going to admit to it now. Right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I drive, when I drive around the countryside and I see stuff like this, it, uh, yeah, because what's in that smoke is particulates, like we were talking about. What creates creosote is those particulates coating to your to your chimney. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so if you're wondering if you're burning it right, once you get the stove up and going, you know you've reloaded the wood. The ends of it are getting black. There's lots of flame, and you shut it down. If you go outside, you shouldn't see any smoke. And if you are, we need to we need to burn some more water out of that wood or get things going a little bit more. We we really don't want to see smoke coming into your chimney. How hot should your chimney be? How hot should your chimney be? Well, the the flue pipe. Yeah. Um, so there's thermometers out there that you can put. The best thing to do is put your put a probe thermometer in, so you're measuring the inside of the flue. And we want to be running probably 12. Are we Fahrenheit people here? Yeah. Yeah. Good. I was raised when we were switching to Celsius, so when it's zero out, I know that's cold. But when it's you know 20 out, I don't know what that means. I know what 80 means. Um, yeah, we want to be around 1,200 degrees inside the flue. Uh, if we have a stove top thermometer, don't put it on the pipe, put it on the stove. We want to be running our stove upwards to 800 degrees on top, typically, and then cycle it down from there. Does that help? But the best thing to do is look at the wood and see if it's black and charred, and then shut it down, because thermometers can be mistaken. <laughs> the thermometer doesn't go on your double pipe? No. Down. No, it does, your thermometer does not go on your double pipe. Where exactly would you put it? Though? On top of the stove. If it's a magnetic thermometer, put yeah. it on top of the stove. On top, like so it's, you can't see it, so you lie it flat? So if it's a, a magnetic thermometer, they're usually just about that thick, mm -hmm. right? They have a magnet on the back, <coughs> plunk it on top of the stove. Oh my and... All those magnetic thermometers are made in the same Chinese factory, it seems, and they all have the wrong information on them. <laughs> That's why I don't like thermometers. But if you're going to have one, top of the stove, like, you know, front corner, back corner, 
and we want to see 600, 800 degrees Fahrenheit on top of that stove before you start shutting it down. Now, on your thermometer, it'll say, over fire, danger, danger, danger. It's not. we got to get it hot. Then we can shut it down. Right? So you got to watch. That's why thermometers can be misleading, because you go to the mass merchants. and Actually, we get thermometers at the store where we ask them to take all that language off, because it's misleading. Yes, sir. Magic key. Have you heard of those that you put on the uh, food? And make the fan. Yeah. <laughs> Magic key. <laughs> yes. Um, we don't see them anymore. Uh, what Magic Heat was was a piece that went into your smoke pipe, and it had a combustor in it. So it would burn the smoke off in your pipe, and you get the heat off the pipe. So a modern wood stove does that inside it. So they were, uh, I haven't seen one of those in probably 15 years. But they are, I know they're still out there somewhere. Okay, we don't, so, you know, we want to be not smoldering the fire, we want to be, you know, burning it smart. We want to burn this fire smart. Um, less smoke. Fewer emissions, which is good for the environment as well. And if we burn wood properly, um, you know, there, there are things that come out of wood burning that if they get in our lungs aren't good. So if we can reduce that, it's good for everybody. And the language you're going to see about the modern wood burning stove is called EPA. It stands for Environmental Protection Agency. In 1989, the Americans passed legislation limiting the amount of wood smoke out of a wood stove. The agency that passed it was the EPA agency, or Environmental Protection Agency. We don't have legislation like this in Ontario still to this day. Today in Ontario, we can take a drum, we can weld four legs on it, we can cut a hole in the front, cut a hole in the top, put a smoke pipe on it, and put it in our house. As long as it's installed according to the code, we can still do that in Ontario. We do not have any smoke regulations on wood burning smoke. So anyway, so they passed this legislation even though a Canadian, an Ontario based company developed the first, you know, catalytic wood stove to burn the smoke out, the Americans were the first ones to pass it. So often we talk about wood stoves being the EPA legislation or their EPA testing wood stoves. So if you don't have a number on your barrel, can you get your insurance to cover you? You don't have a number on your barrel. Yeah, that's that's the whole other issue. <laughs> no certification label, no insurance. There's still some out there, but yeah. And, and just so you know, 1983 is when we started labeling wood stoves. So it's not like it just happened. You know, it happened a long time ago when I had hair. <laughs> that was a lot of time. Okay, so in summary: um, if it's not installed safely can't burn it cleanly. All right, I'm just about to get everybody upset in the room. You ready? <laughs> Who here has a chimney that goes out the wall and up the side of the house? Who here has a chimney that goes straight up through the house? Which one is better? Straight up straight up. Oh, wow, okay. You guys know more about this than I do. Uh, outside chimneys are a North American phenomenon. Go to Europe, you won't see an outside chimney. Um, smoke chimneys need to be warm to draw the smoke out. They need to be inside the house going up through. A chimney up through your house is safer. Why is it safer? It creates less creosote. It usually costs less money. Easier to clean. And easier to clean. <coughs> So often people talk about putting the chimney outside. It's cold, creates creosote, more apt to create a creosote fire. So if you can, I mean, if you're putting a stove here and there's a bathtub there, you can't do that. But I mean, if you can, keep the wood chimney inside the house. You can. If you're in doubt, go to wetink.ca. So you can find a wet certified person or take one of my cards, give me a call. Love chatting about wood. Um, and make sure they're installed correctly. Don't take it. This is fire in your house. This is fire in your house. Okay, I gotta tell you a story because I love this story. 
little old lady, I'm fresh out of school, starting in the industry, comes in, wants to buy a wood cook stove. I'm excited. My first big sale, right? As you know, wood cook, wood cook stoves are not cheap, not inexpensive. And I sat there and talked to her about 20 minutes about her chimney. And she's like, oh, dearie, you know, you're a nice young lad, but I want to talk about the cook stove. I said, and she said, it's, you know, the one I have has been there for 100 years. Her grandmother had it in there. I said, that's why I'm concerned, because she had a brick chimney and it just, you know, went through the wall into the chimney and up. So she took my advice, got her son out, they tore apart the wall, and I used to have this, I don't know what happened to it, but I had a piece of... <coughs> basically two by six, and it was charred. It hadn't caught fire, but a hundred years of heat going through that wall charred that and took away about three inches of that piece of wood. She bought the cook stove from me. A new chimney. <laughs> yeah, she got, yeah, she got a proper wall thimble to go through there. The hidden areas of where a chimney goes are the most important to keep an eye on. Um, there are codes about what should go through walls and how to connect into chimneys. You know, this is fire in your home. We want to make sure it's safe. It's important. Okay, so last slide of the day. You're probably sick of hearing me. Oh, before I do that, we are giving away today a wood tool set with a rake. My colleague at the back, Sean. He has little things for you. Yeah, back there, the good looking guy at the back standing up. He's got little ballots. Go back there, fill it out. Put your name and phone number. On the back, I put three things. If you could circle one. One is, if you want us to know more about this and me or one of my colleagues give you a call, circle, circle that one. If you don't want to be bothered, say, don't bother me. Or if you know of another community group in the surrounding areas that would like a talk like this, Circle that and I'll give you a call and see if, uh, see if we can work something out. Because I love doing these things, they're fun. If we can get this, this information out to people, I think we could have more wood burners in the younger generations coming up. Because there's nothing like a nice big wood pile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'll probably come out with an app for that. <laughs> Press a button, the chainsaw comes out. Yeah, yeah, you're right. No, I mean, there's something about having a big supply of wood in your backyard. It feels good. I don't know if you guys were affected much by the ice storm in 98, but, you know, um, my mom and dad's home, I was living in town at the time, my mom and dad's home was where everybody hung out because we had a wood stove. Right? Insurance company, I think, gave mom and dad money because they didn't have to abandon the house. Right? Stayed in the house and it was cozy for a couple of weeks, but we got by. There's something about wood burning. It's very environmentally responsible and I, you know, I think it's something we should be teaching the younger generation. So, if you know of a community group that would like a talk like this, I would love to give it. Circle that and put it in there and then we will, uh, we will draw a name and have uh, somebody win this lovely $50 tool set. Okay, so I said earlier, the scientists across, North, or across the world have said the carbon loading in the atmosphere is what's causing the changing in the climate, that we're doing that as humans. So if we can reduce our carbon emissions, that's going to be helpful. Space heating. If we have a fireplace, say we have a propane furnace, and we put in a propane fireplace, we'll reduce our carbon emissions by putting in that fireplace by 28%. This was a study done by Paul Rogan at Queen's University, and uh, he took and did, uh, I think, a three-year-long three study to say that if you heat with the same fuel but put in a fireplace or stove, you heat the space you live in, and the rest of the house is cool, you reduce your consumption. You reduce your bill by 28% and your, and your, your carbon emissions. Biomass. Fancy word for wood. Remember the one ton challenge and Rick Mercer was on TV going, one ton reduced by, and nobody knew what the heck it meant. If we heat with a wood stove, we'll reduce our carbon emissions from two to five tons per year, depending on how many cords of wood we burn. That's significant. Solar hot water system, we can reduce about a half a ton per panel. A 
10 kilowatt solar system, about five tons per year. So as you can see, being kind to the environment, but you're being kind by, as long as you're harvesting sustainably, by heating with wood. So, I'm out of breath. I got no more jokes. Is there any more questions? Yes, sir. This is the first time you mentioned solar hot water. How do you uh, do solar hot water in a cold environment like ours? Solar hot water. How do you do solar hot water in a cold environment like ours? You phone me up, pay me a bunch of money, and I do it. <laughs> no. Um, actually, in fact, uh, Queen's University, which is not far from here, um, developed hot water panels that were designed for East, the Eastern Ontario climate. So we're really lucky. They're made in London, Ontario. So what we do is we use propylene glycol. Okay. Have you ever had a McDonald's milkshake? Anybody here have a McDonald's milkshake? <laughs> Anybody here ever ate a Twinkie? Full of propylene glycol. <laughs> so we take this propylene glycol, we pump it to and from the roof. We have a heat exchanger, right? We extract the heat from the glycol, and then we feed that hot water into your existing tank. Okay, so we preheat your water. Your water comes out of your well at about 5 degrees Celsius or 40 Fahrenheit, and we're going to heat it up to about 60 degrees Celsius or what, 120 something degrees Fahrenheit. So if we can take it from 5 and turn it into, you know, 20 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Celsius, that's what we're doing. <coughs> so on an annual basis with solar hot water, you can provide half your house's heat, like for your domestic, your showers and your dishes and all that. On an annual basis, we can provide half your water in Eastern Ontario. At a price of? At a price of? Six to $8,000. It was really popular a few years ago. The government gave you... 3000 bucks to put it in, and that's when a lot of people do it. We don't see it so and much. Not how long? The panels? Uh, it's the pump that you're worried about. The pump that's pumping the glycol. It's probably a 10, 15 year pump. Panels? Uh, there's panels out there. When was Trudeau went off? Because he had that big, that was a long time ago, right? 40 years ago. Yeah. The other Trudeau, sorry, the other Trudeau. Oh, the other one, the old Trudeau. The old, the, yeah, the old guy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So believe it or not, we have. Do you know that Eastern Ontario has the highest sun radiation, other than Southern Saskatchewan and the whole, or all of Canada? Did you know that? We have more solar radiation here than, except for southern Saskatchewan, I don't know why it is, um, but they have more than us. But yeah, so solar, that's why you see so many solar panels in this area, because there's so much solar radiation. It works really well. Yes? Pellet stove piping was a question. So a pellet stove... So how a pellet stove works is we have a fan that's ex assisting the exhaust, okay? The fan is blowing the exhaust out, out the wall. So often people will just stick it out the wall and terminate it, and you can do that. The problem is we're burning wood, and wood has ashes, and those ashes will sometimes get picked up by the wind and blow back on your house. Also, Sometimes the wind can blow back into the pipe, causing the smoke to reverse. Mm -hmm. So with the pellet stove, although it does have a fan assist, it is best to go out the wall and up a few feet or through the overhang, just so the wind won't affect what's going on with the exhaust. And they tend to perform better when you do that as well. They burn cleaner. Does that make sense? Yeah? Anybody else? Oh, sorry. Yeah, so clean burning stoves and mentioned gasification. And what they're talking about there is the burning of the smoke. Okay, baking, they often talk about baking the wood 
gasifying the smoke and burning it off. And you'll get, in the upper area here, you'll get like blue and purple and bright, bright flames. And uh, that's when you know you're really coming into your stride. When It's really cool when the wood is not on fire in the air is. Like that's, that's the ultimate. That's secondary. that's secondary burn. Remember, 60 to 70% of the heat is in the smoke. Burn the smoke, you'll cut your consumption down by a, a third. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you, uh, the lady has a, a wood-burning fireplace that actually has a thermostat on it. Oh, no, it's a wood stove. Oh, it's a wood, oh, you have an RSF wood stove. RSF wood stove. Wow. Make it into a, a fireplace, so it's a wood stove. Okay. Yeah, they have made Yeah, they haven't made those since yeah. about 1993, I think, is when they stopped making those stoves. You know, um, there is some experimentation in the States to put thermostats on wood stoves to control the damper. Um, kids that are used to apps like things that do that. Um, they're still working, like RSF did it and did it in a very unique way. Um, but it didn't really take off. For some people. For some people. Okay. Yeah. They were big stoves and furnaces and stuff. Yeah. So. Not for normal people, but for exceptional people like you, they were. <laughs> I have to clarify that. You're not normal, you're exceptional, because there's lots out there that didn't work very well and caused problems. So, but they're, anyways, they're trying to get to that. They're trying to, they're trying to modernize the wood stoves in the States because they realize the younger generation isn't catching on to it like they should. So I'm not sure where that's going to go. We'll have to just see what the next few years bring. Yeah. Yes. What about district heating like they do in Austria? where they District heat? heating. Yeah, so district heating, there's some, so what district heating is, is you're in a small community and you have one source of heat that then pipes it out to the rest of all the houses. And we, we do have an experimental one in the Okotoks, which is south of Calgary, and they're actually using solar hot water panels to do district heating for that community. So there is some work being done here. The problem in Canada is that we're so spread out typically, mm -hmm. and those who use biomass or wood tend to be rural and tend to have neighbors a long ways away. So it's not something we see as much here as we do in Europe and Scandinavia. Yeah. Yes? Where is wood stove insert to place into a conventional fireplace? Will it burn as efficiently as the wood stove? When a wood burning insert is put into a fireplace, does it burn as efficiently as a wood stove? The answer is yes. As long as you, you know, dry wood, burn in cycles, rake your coals, do all those things, it will. Yeah, we're, basically what they do is they, they take the wood box, they chop the legs off, they put a surround around it, and they shove it in there. I mean, I'm simplifying it, but that's essentially it's the same box. So in North America, to certify a wood stove, remember I mentioned EPA, it costs upwards of $100,000 to certify your box. So if you want to make a wood stove and have it EPA rated, you're going to spend about hundred grand to do that. So typically what manufacturers do is they go, okay, I'll develop one box, I'll make it so it can go into an insert, I'll make it so it can be a freestanding stove. So they're essentially, I guess what I'm trying to say in short is, it's the same box, it's the same technology. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, sir? There used to be a place in Sweden Steel. Yeah, they did. Yeah. I have one Yeah. Yeah, Tweed Steel was, uh, and that was more of a local area. Didn't see Tweed Steel too much outside of eastern Ontario. But yeah. Uh, or another one was heat later, kind of a competitor of Tweed Steel, same idea. And they were fireplaces that basically have, uh, uh, allow for airflow to go around the fireplace so that when you're firing it up and if you got fans in there, you can extract that heat and push it into the room. I got eight inch fans on the bottom. Yeah, so eight inch fans would be fantastic on something like that. Yeah. Yes, sir. There's something that 
has been puzzling me for quite a bit. I've been learning books for more than 30 years. And back when we were selling the Friends of the Island, uh, it was in uh, a combination of oil and wood furnace. And uh, it worked fine. Uh, a friend of mine did it actually, I don't know if it's feasible for some people here. He burned in his basement a wood stove, hot, for about three days. So I think the easiest, so question, question was um, hardwood versus softwood, there seems to, you know, softwood seems to burn hotter, have more heat units in it than hardwood um, because of the coals and stuff. But what, what happened at a molecular level, wood is the same when we get down to the molecule. When we start building the tree, what we find is that in hardwoods, we have a higher mineral content in the wood. So that mineral content doesn't necessarily burn and turn into heat, right? Um, best way to, to illustrate that is people have pellet stoves, and if they burn like a Douglas fir pellet, which is hard to get around here because it comes from BC typically, and they were to burn a, a, let's say, an oak or a maple or a hardwood pellet, they would find with the Douglas fir pellet, we end up with very little ashes, very little leftover in, in with the hardwood, we end up with what's called a clinker, yeah. and it's and it's like a hardened piece of chunk of carbon that doesn't burn, and it's just hardwood has more minerals in it, and that's maybe why it doesn't. When you break it down per pound, we buy our wood as cord wood. We don't buy it per pound, but if we were per pound, softwood has more heat in it per pound. So you know, now ten pounds of, of softwood might be you know, this big, yeah. and 10 pounds of hardwood might be this big, but per pound, it has a higher heat content. And that's, and that's studies that have done by the Pellet Fuel Institute in the U.S. and other folks in the U.S. that have studied it. Yeah. Yeah. I was always told that softwoods build up in my chimney. Yeah. So I'm, I'm better off to stay with hardwood. All that sap and softwood's going to gum up your chimney. Timer so I'm, be, I'm better. Is, is that still true? No. <laughs> Never was true. No, no. Softwood. The problem is if you don't dry softwood, it's going to have some sap, and that's going to cause issues. So as long as you're drying the softwood properly, you don't have to worry about it. Cedar is fine. Pine is fine. Spruce is fine. As long as it's dry. You got to get dry. No, no. Softwood will dry faster. You put it in that sun. It'll dry, it'll dry, that, you know, it'll, it'll be a lot faster. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. So we, we had a, an experiment in our hunt camp, and uh, one night we stacked the stove up with white birch. And then come morning, there was no ash, there was no coals. The white birch, birch went right down to ash. But the following night, we just used the maple, and come the next morning, we'd have coals. We just stir it and throw some more wood on there. Yeah, the, what a lot of us here in Eastern Ontario don't realize that we're really lucky. 
do you know that we have the greatest variety of, of mixed woods than, uh, than anywhere in the world? So Ottawa, as a capital of a country, has the greatest variety of mixed woods than any other capital in the world. There are people that just have fir trees and pine trees, and they eat their houses with it. You know, you go to northern Ontario, you go to western Ontario, western Canada, softwoods. right? It's all softwoods. So, I mean, hardwood is basically any leaf fairy that loses its leaves are actually outside of the poplar. Yeah. Considered most of them. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Poplar. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I'd like you to give give me your knowledge on the merit of uh, like fire bricks inside, like for example, a Canada stove. Uh, what's the merit of that, really? If you say they're burnt out and you want to put new ones in, can you get them? And, and is it reasonable? Uh, to do so, that? so fire bricks inside a wood stove. Yes. Uh, they burn out on an older wood stove. So yeah, I mean fire bricks can you get are standard size in all those old stoves. They're four and a half inches by nine inches by an inch and a quarter thick. Um, it's the same fire bricks you'll see in this demonstrator right here. Um, and yes, they're available in two densities. One will be a light density and one will be a heavy density. And the old Canadas, the old airtights, heavier density would be better because that's what they were built with. And they're probably, I think we sell them for four or five dollars a brick. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so there's readily, readily available. Absolutely. And you put them on the bottom and on the sides? All wood stoves are a little bit different, but typically, yes, you put it on the bottom and on the sides and the back of the stove. But they're they're all a little bit different on, on their design for that. What holds them together? Do you get a special uh, mortar for that? Yeah, so what holds the bricks together? Nothing. The ashes of the wood fire does. So, this is, I'm glad you brought this up. When do I replace the fire bricks in my wood stove? When they start breaking apart. If they're cracking, but still have their thickness, it's fine because there's cracks between the fire bricks themselves and the ash will naturally fill it. I don't know if you've ever tried to take bricks out of a 20 year old fissure, but you have to get in there with a crowbar, <laughs> right? It's almost like cement in there, right? Or an old airtight, it's like cement in there. So when they start crumbling and falling apart, you know, spend the $5 per brick and go grab some and throw them. So they're just piled in there like that and they seize up with the ashes. You got it, they just sit in there, yeah. They just okay. sit in there, yeah. The bottom ones actually hold the sides up, right? And that's the way they do Not it. necessarily. No. Not necessarily. Is that the other reason? Yeah, like these ones and this one. And often you'll see that fire bricks will sit. The bottom ones may go in and the other ones sit on top, or they may go vice versa. Every wood stove manufacturer has a different take on how to do that. So, yeah, not necessarily. Yes, back there. I was always taught by my dad that she never used a vacuum, though, so that's just a reason to suck the ashes between the Yeah, never use a vacuum if you don't want to suck the ashes. Yeah. You know, you're absolutely right. Use a use a shovel to scoop your ashes out. Leave the ash vacuums for the pellet stove people. <laughs> Makes more sense. Yes, in the back there. So the question is, there's some stoves now made of soapstone. And those stoves have been around since the mid to late 80s, not very popular, not as popular here in Canada, but if you went into Maine, uh, New Hampshire, New York State, very popular soapstone stoves are down there. So what soapstone is, is it's typically like two and a half inches thick. Usually the outside wall and the inside of the stove is, is the same piece of soapstone. And the concept is thermal mass. And what that means is once you get that soapstone warm, takes a lot of time to get it warm, but once you do, it holds the heat and radiates for a very long period of time. So that's, it's just a selling feature of a different type of doing wood heating. It's like steel will heat up really quickly and cool down really quickly. Soapstone will take forever. A soapstone stove will never get more than 500 degrees on top of it, but it will stay there for hours and hours and hours and hours. Soapstone stoves, you typically take money out of your furniture budget and put it in your stove budget. <laughs> because we have soapstone that's mined in Brazil, we have castings that are made in Spain, and then they're usually assembled in America. And those stoves, when they're put together, because it's all natural, the person who makes the stove typically signs the back of it because it's like a piece of art. 
So that's why you take money out of your furniture budget, <laughs> put it in your, and I can tell you it works any more efficiently. It's just, it's a lot more aesthetically pleasing. It looks nicer in the house. Yeah. Yeah. How about your cast iron stove? Cast iron stoves, yeah. As opposed to the, the uh, steel one. As opposed to steel stove. So in Canada, we have a tradition of steel, right? We had a lot of people making steel stoves. Um, in Europe, there's a big tradition of cast iron. So cast iron is just a thicker metal. It will hold the heat a little bit longer. I'm not going to tell you it's a lot longer, but a little bit longer. Uh, once again, cast iron, there's a certain look to the stove that people like, so that's usually why they choose it. Okay. And I guess, once again, as long as they have the reburn technology inside here, they're all working relatively the same. Yeah, typically cast iron stoves won't have fire bricks in them. Fire bricks tend to, to push the heat out the front or absorb some of the heat, so cast iron will tend to heat all the way around like a soapstone stove more so. Yeah, that's correct. It's just the part of their design. Yeah. Looks like people are starting to get restless. <laughs>